low and middle income countries, um, there haven't been the same benefits from the, the, the advances that have happened in prevention and care in high income countries. The volume notes that one of the main reasons is due to a lack of population wide strategies to address behavioral risk factors like smoking or poor diet, uh, physical inactivity. Uh some of the activities that we see, for example, in our workplaces in high income countries where there's incentivization of physical activity, or we see our cities are being redesigned to incorporate more pedestrian plaza to encourage physical activity and public transport use, um, those kinds of high visibility um, changes in lifestyle or, or encouragement of changes in lifestyle are not as prominent in low and income countries. Mm -hmm. Sure. So tobacco control strategies are one of the prime examples, uh, given we have a lot of evidence showing that a comprehensive strategy in tobacco control is much more effective than any of its components alone. So taxation of tobacco becomes more effective when it's combined with a campaign for raising awareness on the health effects of smoking, with pictorial warnings on packets, uh, plain packaging, bans on smoking in public areas, cessation programs. Um, often, opponents of tobacco taxes will say that they end up costing the government tax revenue because of reduced consumption of tobacco products, um, and also that they may have a larger financial burden on the poor. However, uh, some of the research described in this volume um, of DCP3 shows that when all financial and health savings of reduced smoking are taken into account, the financial incidence of a tobacco control package may be progressive. This means that on the whole, more benefits accrue to the poor than to the rich. Now for the challenges associated with implementation, particularly in low middle income countries, um, a lot of them have to do with difficulties in enforcement. So whether it's smoking bans or sales restrictions, uh, but also with resistance uh, often resulting from pressure and campaigning from tobacco multinationals. Now, treating CVRDs in their early stages or during an acute event like a heart attack or stroke, that can prevent serious complications later and save lives. However, these uh, control strategies are being underutilized in low and middle income countries. For instance, 49% of people with hypertension in high income countries were aware of it compared to 31% in low income countries. And then you have 49% of people with hypertension in high income countries that were being treated for it versus 32% in low, in low income countries. So there's this, this uh, significant disparity between high income countries and low income countries. So after prevention, probably the next step for for tackling CVRD, that is, again, best value for money after prevention is likely to be uh, uh, treat, catching and treating CVRD in their early stages. Uh, but there again, we find that low and middle income countries have um, several reasons, but 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 many reasons to um, to not be able to first diagnose and screen people with these conditions in the early stages, which are gen these conditions are generally asymptomatic, and that's because there really isn't a primary care system that can serve as a cashment for the large populations that we're talking about. And then a second reason that we talk about in in this volume is the lack of a uniform approach or regional guidelines that are sort of context, context specific. For example, in the setting of a acute event like a heart attack, there haven't been as of yet many protocols to guide a rural health clinic as to what to do. And you know, as a clinician, we could say, well, at the very least, they could provide aspirin and timely transfer of care. And both of these things could be time saving. But the problem is that these health clinics have not been empowered to do so. So they don't know exactly how to step in. Right after prevention, getting treatment in the early stages is really important. And these missed opportunities to treat CVRDs in their early stages is a problem because then it leads to advanced conditions, uh, complications later. And this will require specialists and specialized facilities. That even, even if we had the best case scenario where the maximal prevention strategies were implemented, then we had optimal early prevention. As clinicians, we know that it's unavoidable that people will develop advanced 
conditions, whether that's because of the pathogenesis of their disease or whether it's behavioral and um, or, or because they have a unique condition that we don't know how to prevent or, or treat early on, um, there will be a need for care for persons with advanced CVRD in, in low and middle income countries. And I think our volume rather uniquely acknowledges that there needs to be a strategy in most at least middle income countries, maybe in some low, low middle income countries as well, to tackle diseases in, in their advanced stages. And the challenge is not only in acquiring trained personnel and technologies, for example, for dialysis delivery, but also in ensuring that there is financial sustainability on parts of the government and on parts of the patient. Um, because for if we, um, even if we make dialysis therapy available, for example, um, we have to offer it to people who can uh, uh, use it without become without having catastrophic health expenditure, as Nasreen. Mentioned.